Hey there, and welcome to our Catalyst service. I'm Scott Beha. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's a privilege to host you here at our online church. We've got a couple songs for you and a sermon from our student pastor, Anna Blake, tonight. And so uh, make sure that you participate in each element of the service. Uh, that's the way that you get the most out of worshiping from home. So when it's time to sing, try standing and singing. When it's time to pray, actually pray. And when it's time for the sermon, take notes and follow along. And during the response time, whatever it is the Lord lays on your heart, however you should be responding, is what you should do during that time. Make sure you participate and you'll get the most out of this experience. Let me pray for you and then we'll get started this evening. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to pause in the middle of our week and just be reminded of who you are, to come into a place of worship in our homes and to be uh, taught something new from your word that might actually transform who we are on the inside. So I pray, God, that we would never be the same as the result of showing up for online church tonight. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. You say Southridge Church as long as you can, okay? okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Does everybody understand? Yeah. Get that out of Hudson. your mouth, buddy. Good. All right, hold on. One, two, three, go. Good evening. Hudson, we need you to say Shout something. Shout this chat. All right, let's try it again. Ready, set, go. Good evening. Shout this chat. Let's wash.
Well, if you're new to checking Southridge Church out and want to further connect, send a text to the number 304-825-2595 that says SRC online, and we'll follow up with you to help you get further connected to our church. This is the point in our service where we would normally be taking our offering, and uh, since we're totally digital, here's the best ways for you to be able to give. You can click on the giving tab here at Church Online, or you can go to src.life slash giving and give a one-time or a recurring gift there. Let me pray for the offering that we'll get into this evening's message. Lord, thank you for every single person that's been giving faithfully to Southridge Church. Thank you for every single um, dollar that has come in to be able to feed frontline healthcare workers, to, to give to the food pantry, and to continue to do ministry right here um, at Southridge Church and get the gospel message out. I pray for all those that are giving faithfully, Lord, that they would be incredibly blessed during this time. And once again, we pray for all those that have been affected by this horrible virus and all that comes along with that, the loss of jobs, the loss of life, the loss of security. Father, we pray for those and that you would move in their situation. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. I'm Anna Blake, the youth pastor here at Southridge Church, and we are excited to be with you tonight. If someone were to come up to you a year ago and tell you that this is what today would look like, April 29th, 2020, if they told you face masks, look at this, face masks, gloves, social distancing was going to be your reality, how would you have responded to that? I know for me, if someone were to say that, a year ago, I would think that they were a lunatic because I'd never experienced anything like that before. I mean, I haven't even heard stories, personal stories from people that I know who have experienced something like this before. So, of course, they would have been crazy. But now, hindsight being 2020, if someone were to say that, I would think that they were some kind of enlightened fortune teller or something. But that is our reality. Right now, things are really strange. And it's easy to want to escape reality. I know some of the things that I've done lately to escape reality include binge watching shows on Hulu. I watched all of the American Idol episodes in about two days, and I cried every time. I have cooked pancakes eight times in a day for every meal and every in-between meal. Pancakes are great. I have connected with friends through phone calls and online chats. And this might be the most embarrassing one. I've escaped reality through buying my dogs super cute clothes online and making them wear it around the house. Um, actually, I'm not that embarrassed by that. That sounds awesome. So what have you been doing to escape reality? Maybe you've been going for a lot of walks. Maybe you've been exercising more or reading a good book listening to music to get your mind off of what's so real around you. Maybe you've done things that are you're more ashamed of, things that you might not want to mention to escape reality. Either way, it's hard not to want to do that from time to time, to get away from what seems so real and out of our control. Sometimes we're just looking for the exit when it comes to real life. But what if I were to tell you that Jesus followers do not escape reality? Jesus followers don't escape reality. They enlighten it. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Before we get too much into it, let's pray. God, right now, I just want to invite you in. God, I ask that you help us understand. God, I ask that you open our eyes. And God, I pray that 
you allow us to be light in dark places just as you are a light in dark places. In Jesus' name, pray these things. Amen. So we're going to be looking into the book of Ephesians tonight. That's in your New Testament. Ephesus, the city, was a very strategic city. It was very important to the region. It was a port city. Um, The Roman civilization and other civilizations, in order to get to Asia Minor and to the east, they would typically have to go through Ephesus. So it was pretty popular, like like a big city for its time. And Paul, the apostle, had spent a lot of time there in Ephesus with people that he grew to love dearly. Like, he really got to know these people, and he loved them with all of his heart. And he was so excited that they were following Jesus just like he had taught them. And he just couldn't love them more, knowing that they were doing those things. But at this particular time, when this letter was written, Paul was unable to be with the people that he loved so dearly. Could you imagine what that would be like? Unable to be with the people you love dearly? I bet you can. So this is where Paul is coming from as he writes this. He is still able to bring them encouragement, though he is distanced from them. He wrote to the Ephesians with the purpose of strengthening their Christian faith, strengthening them by explaining the nature and the purpose of the church the body of Christ. Now I said the church, the body of Christ, not the church, the building where people gather, but instead the human lives that are being transformed in their personal day-to-day experience and relationship with Jesus. In Paul's writing, we see this picture of what the church really can look like in society. Paul challenges Jesus' followers to live in such a way that they are like Jesus on earth still. So let's go ahead, Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Let's read together. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. We'll stop right there for a second. One of the things that just happened here at Southridge Church is we did a drive-through prayer experience. And let me just tell you, it was incredible to see people praying, gathering, and talking to God from their cars and, and social distancing friendly. It was awesome. But right here we see Paul He's praying for the Jesus followers in Ephesus to know God better. You see, reading the Bible, even reading spiritual books about growing in your faith and listening to your favorite worship soundtrack on and on again, those are all wonderful things. But there's no substitute for knowing God personally. The difference between knowing someone and knowing about someone is all in the time spent with that person. When I saw some people come through drive through prayer, it took everything in me to hold back from running to them, hugging them, you know, like giving them a dap or something, like just to make some kind of physical connection because I love them and I miss them. And that didn't happen just the second they drove up the hill. It happened through years of getting to know them personally. You see, it's the same thing with Jesus. When we know him personally, We can't help but run to him when we see him. When we see him doing something, it stirs something in us to just be driven towards him. And that comes only from knowing him personally. We get to know Jesus through seeing what he was like here on earth, the Gospels, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And we get to know him by talking to him through prayer daily, looking for what he's looking for, and being him in the world around us. A personal relationship with Jesus, it will change your reality. There is no doubt about it. Our reality might actually be that buildings are closed for gathering, but the church, Jesus' church, is not confined 
by walls. The church of Jesus, his people, they are all over the world, and they are doing Jesus' things all over the world. These are people who love Jesus and are committed to serving him no matter what. Jesus' followers, you have this incredible gift, the Holy Spirit, and you are filled with that power. God has provided his Holy Spirit to enable us to live his way. To utilize the Spirit's power, all we have to do is lay aside our own evil desires and draw on his power for a new life, a new reality that he has called us to. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called, the riches of his glorious inheritance to his holy people, and his supremely great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, above all power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Verse 18, I'm going to reread that because, because. Verse 18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which he has called you. Man, the eyes of your heart. What have the eyes of your heart seen? What things has your heart connected itself to that you know might be good or bad? I know when I was 24 years old, I had the incredible opportunity to have LASIK eye surgery. And whenever I laid back on that table, prepared for that surgery, I can remember looking up at the wall and seeing this like white blur. And I laid back and I looked up at these bright lights and I heard these awful sounds. And when I sat back up, seven minutes later, I looked over at that white blob on the wall and I could see that it was a clock on the wall. You see, I had been visually impaired since I was six years old. I was in first grade when I got my first pair of glasses. And I can remember thinking that it wasn't fair and that I couldn't understand why my vision was just getting worse every year as I got older. Thankfully, it did plateau to where I was able to get the procedure. But for that moment, on that operating table, at 4.12 in the afternoon, I can remember looking and seeing time for the first time in a long time. And when I think of that, what would happen if we were to ask the Spirit of God to remove the blur from the eyes of our heart and to see things clearly for the first time? That first morning that I woke up and could see was radical. I had never in my memory had that happen. What would happen if you were to wake up and see with the eyes of your heart for the first time in a long time? Imagine what that could be like. The Spirit of God can absolutely remove the blur from our heart eyes. Give your heart eyes a chance to be enlightened and to experience something radical. When I looked up this word enlighten, I was pleasantly surprised to find the description. Enlighten is a verb, and it means to give someone greater knowledge and understanding about a subject or a situation. To enlighten, to share that knowledge with somebody, it's a call to act. Paul is praying for Jesus' followers to be enlightened, not just an action to them from God, but to then turn that into an enlightenment for those around us, to help others see what we have been shown. This 
enlightening, this ability to see what's around us, it's not an opportunity to escape. It's not an opportunity to be able to see for the first time the exit sign and get out as quick as we can. Instead, it is calling us to be Jesus, to have, we have that ability to be Jesus himself and make a difference now. We can enlighten reality as we know it. Do not run from this great opportunity. As Christians, man, we can be confident that God has won this final victory. It is over. He is in control of everything. We need to not fear. As we would have seen a little bit earlier in Paul's letter, the contract has been signed and sealed. Man, praise God. Like, you don't have to worry about any of it. Let's keep going in Paul's letter here, verse 22. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Man, church, you have the ability to be the full expression of Jesus now. You have that ability right now. As we read through Paul's letter, We should thank God for this amazing family he's given us. It's unique and diverse, and it has the ability to change the reality around us. We need to continue to pray for our brothers and sisters across the world as Paul prayed for this church in Ephesus. And we need to draw near to our local church, our family and our friends in whatever way we can. Attending an online service is one of those ways to draw near to each other, to encourage each other, and to encourage others and give them hope that they may desperately need. God's purpose for the church, it is not closed down. It is not canceled, nor is it postponed. God's purpose for the church is still to press on the gospel message to people all over from one end of the earth to the other. When we respond to Jesus' love by trusting in him, it's crazy, but his mission, or his purpose becomes our mission. When we understand what Jesus was about, suddenly we are about those things too. When we trust him, when we follow him, the reality is, as Paul is writing here, Jesus is the center of it all. And because of this, his power, it has to be at the center of us. We do this by placing all of our priorities under his control. Man, priorities. (laughs) What priorities have taken over you lately? What things have been in first place? If you're a Jesus follower, man, it's time to come back. Come back to the reality And allow him to be in control of your priorities. If you're not a Jesus follower, I just want you to know this. That God created all people, including you, to be in a relationship with him. And our sin, it separates us from God. But perfect Jesus paid the price for sin. A price that is way too expensive for you and I to pay. It cannot be paid off by enough good things or coming to online church enough, but only by the perfect life of Jesus. And he paid that price. And he died and rose again. And every person who believes in him is given a new life, an eternal life. And life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. If you believe that message, I ask that you would talk to God, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and and tell him you believe from your heart and from your lips. Let him know that that's what you believe, and let him be in charge of your new life, because you have a role to play. God made you and every every other person on purpose with a purpose. We must use the Holy Spirit's power through Jesus in combination with our God-given gifts to enlighten, encourage, and equip other Jesus followers for his service. We have a role to play in this living church. 
as the people of God. This past week, I had a teenager um, ask me this question. They sa- she said, how do you introduce somebody to God during this time? That kind of blew my mind because she recognized that she couldn't bring someone physically to the church building, but she also recognized the reality that there were other ways to engage and to equip and to have a God conversation with the people that you are still connected with. Man, she demonstrated that Jesus' followers do not escape reality, but instead they enlighten reality around them. God, he's calling you too. He's calling you to quit numbing reality and step into the role and the purpose that you truly have. We are separate in location, but we are united in Christ. We serve because we know the ultimate servant. We generate change because we've been changed. And we enlighten others because we have been enlightened. We do not escape because we don't have to. We already have the victory. My prayer over you today is going to be taken exactly from Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. Let me pray for you. God, I'm going to keep asking that you, the glorious Father, may give your spirit of wisdom and revelation so that this person, these people, can know you better. I pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope in which you have called us, God. The riches of your glorious inheritance for us, your holy people, and your supremely great power for those of us who believe. God, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, we hope that you had a great experience here at Southridge Church Online. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight, would you send a text that says Jesus to 304-825-2595 so we can follow up with you and get you into a digital discipleship process. Just a quick reminder, we're still collecting food for the local food pantry. You can drop that off tomorrow, Thursday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, the front doors will be locked. One of our elders will be inside to let you in and uh, you can drop your food off and we'd be happy to get that to the food pantry. That way we can continue to make a difference here in our community. So once again, thanks for checking us out. We hope that you have a great remainder of your week.